Now I'm going to go into the talk today, my brief talk. The talks today will examine the different way that statisticians, actuaries, and economists played an active role in Britain during the Second World War. There are those who became statisticians because of the war. Some were already involved in war work, and others helped to shape the discipline of mathematical statistics during the war. Actuaries also played a pivotal role in the development of the NHS. Whilst Italian economists forecast a new economic order in Italy. Today we will hear how statisticians changed the war and how the war changed statistics, to borrow a line from Helen Joyce from her economist paper. Wars can reshape the lives of many people, and our first two speakers will show how the war helped to make statisticians out of unsuspecting men who had planned on different careers. Helen Joyce, editor of the Economist International Section, interviewed a number of eminent statisticians in 2014 to find out why, the, why they had become statisticians during the Second World War. Her article was published in the Christmas issue of The Economist later that year, and now everybody has a copy because she kindly gave one to everyone today. She examined the different career paths a number of men took before they became statisticians in Britain during the war. We will learn, for example, that the late Klaus Moser became a statistician because he was put into prison. His initial aspiration was to be a pianist, but the war threw these plans into disarray. Joyce also noted that in 1939, Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, selected Frederick Lindemann to set up a statistical arm of the civil service. When Churchill became Prime Minister, Lindemann established a special statistics branch known as the S Branch. This branch distilled thousands of bits of data into succinct charts and figure so that the status of the nation's food supply could be, for example, instantly evaluated. These bar charts that you see on the slide are now on display in the cabinet war rooms. They compared Allied shipping tonnage lost to new ships delivered each month. The bar charts also compared the bomb tonnage dropped by Germany on Britain with that dropped by the Allies on Germany. Lindemann's statistical branch became Churchill's personal statistical service, which eventually led to the creation of a central wartime statistical office. Other statisticians Joyce interviewed included Sir David Cox and Peter Armitage, both of whom were presidents of the Royal Statistical Society, as was uh, Lord Moser, whom I forgot to mention. From 1944 to 1946, Cox worked at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, where he undertook the statistical quality control in the manufacture of aircraft components. Peter Armitage's wartime work involved using sequential methods which analyzed samples as they were taken, rather than waiting until the entire sample size was collected. He joined the Weapons Procurement Agency, the Ministry of Supply, where he worked on statistical problems with George Barnard. Together they applied quality control and sampling methods to the products for which they were responsible. We will later hear about the other statisticians whom Joyce interviewed when she speaks. John Aldrich, who has published a number of seminal papers on the history of statistics and is, until his retirement was at Southampton University, will show how developments during the Second World War in education in Britain changed part of the educational and training process for statisticians. This was accomplished when various government ministers aimed to increase the supply of trained mathematical statisticians 
to match a perceived demand. He will examine the instruments of transformation at the national level, the mobilization of scientific manpower, and at the local level activities within universities and government departments. His paper focuses on the projectile development establishment and the supply chain of the graduates from the University of Cambridge to the Ministry of Supplies Advisory Service on Quality Control. These units produce such post-war leaders as Morris Bartlett and David Kendall, Dennis Lindley and Robin Plackett, for whom I don't have a photo, but John says he does. Sorry. Oh, that, okay, that's, that's it for, for John's. Moving on to Josie Harris, who has published extensively on the history of social policy and has written a claim biography on William Beveridge, is an emeritus professor of modern history at Oxford. Beveridge, too, was a president of the Royal Statistical Society. She will discuss the enormous stimulus given to the growth of the actuary's profession in both public and private sectors. By the National Insurance Act of 1911, and by the appointment for the first time of professional government actuary in 1912. And then by the creation of a fully fledged government actuaries department within the civil service in 1917. The expanding role of actuaries in both public and private sectors played a pivotal role in the interwar economy. Harris will discuss how the outbreak of the Second World War created a crisis in the actuarial profession because many actuaries and their clients enlisted or were conscripted. And this was exacerbated by the Beveridge Committee on Social Insur Insurance and Allied Services of 1942. This committee devised a scheme of universal state protection against the cost of childcare, sickness, unemployment, and old age. But it was seen as threatening large parts of the private insurance industry, including the large-scale public-private partnership schemes that had grown up since 1911. The person who had a leading role on the committee was the was the government, the first government actuary, Sir George Epps, who was quite favorable to Beveridge's scheme, and who played a large part in framing many of its principles and details. In writing this paper, Harris was able to access certain documents and items of official and private correspondence, which were not available when she wrote the her biography of Beveridge. The reception by the British people of the publication of the Beveridge Report in December 1942 was euphoric. Conversely, Churchill's reaction was very adverse, which was shared by some of some, but by no means all of his ministers and advisors. Moreover, to Epps' great embarrassment, the Beveridge Report was strongly criticized by, by colleagues within his own government, his government's actuary department, and by many private members of the actuarial profession. In February 1943, Epps led three one-day national conferences organized by the Institute of Actuaries to discuss the practical, financial, and political implications of the beverage plan. Harris will conclude her paper by reviewing the criticisms of the beverage plan made at this time by the actuarial profession and their implications for future policy. For our last paper, we will leave war-torn Britain and head over to Italy. Our last speaker, Jean-Guy Prévost, is a professor 
in the Department of Political Science at the University of Quebec in Montreal. He has written extensively on the history of statistics in relation to political and intellectual history, including his book, A Total Science, Statistics in Liberal and Fascist Italy. With his colleague, Jean-Pierre Beau, they co-wrote co Statistics, Public Debate, and the State, 1800 to 1945. Prevost will show us that Italy's 10-year-long involvement in the war, which began with its invasion in Ethiopia in October 1935, and culminated in its in entry into the global conflict, provided fertile material for Italian economists and statisticians. They became actively engaged in discussions that ranged from immediate concerns, such as financing the war, controlling inflation, and procuring the raw materials needed for the war industry. This group was also interested in the more speculative issues like the post-war new economic order, the meaning of autarky, and the concept of large economic spaces. Autarchy involved a policy of establishing national economic self-sufficiency and independence. Hence, it is a closed economy. But during wartime Italy, as Prevost will explain, autarky was not so much an economic policy as a necessity due to the sanctions imposed on Italy following its attack on Ethiopia. By 1931, all university professors of economics or statistics had taken the pledge to fascism and its El Duce, Mussolini, that was now required from them. Prevost will conclude his talk by indicating that the ideas these various groups of economists and statisticians had defended during the war did, to a certain degree, shape Italy's economic policy after the war. Whilst comprehensive economic planning was, of course, ruled out, long-term planning and the milder version put forward were an enduring topic in the post-war period. And in 1954, a Keynesian-inspired plan known as the Schema Venoni was indeed adopted. Prevost's talk will end the individual discussions of his meetings.